This is Dr. Lee from reconstructface.com. In this lecture, we're going to be discussing a complex midfascia trauma case. This is part A of the case report and is designed for junior residents. We'll be reviewing preoperative CT scans and discuss surgical approaches and the sequence of procedures to be performed. In part B of this lecture, we'll be showing the actual surgery. We'll examine a case that looks something like this and demonstrate how to repair it so that it can look something like this. In this section, we'll scroll through preoperative CT scans, and I'd like for you to identify fractures on your own before we review them together. We'll start out by examining some notable findings. Here in the green rectangle shows bilateral terrier plates. And by scrolling through this, you can see that there may be a hairline fracture located here, but the slice above it shows that the pterygoid is intact. So this particular patient does not have bilateral pterygoid fractures, so anticipate that the patient's palate is not mobile and have no malocclusion. Next, scrolling up higher, here you can see the malar eminence. I generally draw a straight line across the malar eminence. You can see that in this image, the axial slice had been taken with the patient's head tilted. This is the reason why the line is tilted due to the way the imaging was obtained. However, you want to generally draw a straight line across the malar eminence. You can see on the patient's right side, which is on the left side of the screen, the malar eminence is depressed about four millimeters. The malar eminence depression alone, as a surgical indication, can be a gray area. You should use your judgment and consider patient's age and their concern for cosmesis, as well as their health. In this particular patient, she's relatively young with good mentation. Four millimeter depression would result in a significant facial asymmetry. So in this case, it was a surgical indication. In a patient who's not bothered by the cosmetic change or is presenting with significant comorbidities, or other serious life-threatening injuries, malar depression alone is a soft surgical indication. Now, you can see a zygomatic arch fracture noted. One thing to note is how there's a normal curvature of the zygomatic arch highlighted in yellow, and the fracture side shows that the zygomatic arch shape has been grossly distorted. In this rest segment, this section of the zygomatic arch can sometimes be depressed. You can see that if it's medially depressed further, it can potentially push up against the coronary process of the mandible and result in trismus. If you see trismus from severe zygomatic arch depression, this is a surgical indication because the patient will not be able to open their mouth. In this particular case, due to the lack of significant zygomatic arch depression, I would anticipate the patient to have near normal mouth opening once the pain is controlled. As we scroll up higher, the blue arrow marks a medial buttress fracture, while the orange circle marks a lacrimal duct opening and its associated lacrimal bone fracture. The lacrimal bone fracture continues up superiorly to the level of the medial canthus. It's important to note that the green arrow shows likely the site where the medial canthus attaches. Medial canthus is attached anterior and posterior to the lacrimal sac and surrounds it. By identifying the lacrimal sac on a CT scan, you can see if the bone segment where the medial canthus attaches is also disrupted. Now looking at this, the bone where the medial canthus is attached is likely intact with minimal displacement, despite there being a fracture that you can see. Scrolling up superiorly, the left side of the frontal sinus has some partial pacification, signifying that there is some sort of bony fracture nearby. 
However, the frontal recess and the anterior and posterior tables of the frontal sinus are intact, so there's no issue with the frontal sinus. We'll scroll through the coronal scans next. Here you can see that there's a very obvious medial buttress fracture. You can see that this is a severely medialized and is obstructing the nasal airway on the right side. Here is a type 1 NOE fracture that we saw from the axial cuts. The medial canthus is likely intact and remain attached. You can see that this bone segment is fairly large without comminution. As such, this is a type 1 NOE fracture. Here you can see the nasal lacrimal duct and you can see that it is obviously been fractured and is displaced. You can see the lateral buttress fractures coming into view. Here you can see the zygomedical maxillary buttress fractures that's been severely comminuted and displaced into the maxillary sinus. Here is the infraorbital nerve foramen being fractured. This is a very common site of fracture in the midface. Also more superiorly along the lateral buttress involving the zygomedical frontal buttress, there is another fracture line that is starting up high. Here is a second fracture involving the zygomedical frontal buttress. Here is a relatively small orbital floor fracture located posterior to the infraorbital foramen. This is typically where the infraorbital nerve will travel along the orbital floor. This likely corresponds to the zygomedical frontal suture as it enters the lateral orbital wall, but not quite at the zygomedical sphenoid suture line. Highlighted in the green are the pterygoids. It's important to check the pterygoids in the coronal slices as well. You can see that the coronal cuts do not reveal pterygoid plates that's been disrupted. As such, I would expect stable midface with normal occlusion in the absence of mandible fracture. This is why I'm calling this an incomplete Lefort 1 fracture. Next, we'll look at the midline structures. Looking at the nasal airway, here is a left nasal airway highlighted in the blue triangle, showing that it is quite open anteriorly. Here is inferior turbinate and septum coming into view. Now, you can see the right nasal airway highlighted in the lighter blue. You can see as you scroll back, the right lateral nasal wall has completely collapsed as the medial buttress is essentially inside the right nasal airway. This is resulting in a severe nasal airway obstruction on the right side. Here is another view of the nasal lacrimal duct. Now, when I look at the septum, I generally draw a vertically straight line going down the middle. You can see in the patient that the septum starts out relatively straight anteriorly. However, about mid-septum, you have this large bony spur that juts out over to the right. This is likely a pre-existing septal spur. Here, you can actually see that it's touching the lateral nasal wall. This pattern continues until reaching the posterior septum, at which point it straightens back out. Here is another view from the axial. You can see that it starts out relatively straight, starts going over to the right with the large septal spur touching the lateral nasal wall. The right nasal airway is completely collapsed, then it becomes straight again, more superiorly. When you combine these individual fracture segments, you have zygomedical maxillary complex fracture from the involvement of the zygomedical frontal, zygomedical maxillary, zygomedic arch, and infraorbital rim. You also have NOE type 1 fracture from the nasal frontal buttress fracture, infraorbital rim fracture, and nasal maxillary buttress fracture. Next, we have an incomplete Lefort 1 fracture from the nasal maxillary buttress fracture and the zygomedical maxillary buttress fracture. Lastly, we have septal spur with collapsed right lateral nasal wall, as well as a right-sided lacrimal duct fracture. It's important to identify all your surgical indications and problems and come up with a plan before the surgery so that you can efficiently perform the surgery and have a predictable surgical outcome. Once you have a diagnosis and identified all the fractures, next step is to identify surgical indications as well as treatment goals of the upcoming surgery.
We have loss of major support buttresses involving the midface. We also have nasal obstruction and chronic epiphora. It's also important to have clear surgical treatment goals. Our goal in this case is to restore upper and mid-face structural support, restore normal nasal airflow, stent the lacrimal duct to avoid lacrimal duct stenosis. As you can see, this case will involve multiple procedures being performed to achieve desired surgical outcome. Next, we'll discuss best surgical approaches for the fractures that require rigid fixation. For the zygomedical frontal buttress suture fractures, I'm going to be using a pre-existing laceration and perform rigid fixation. If you don't have a pre-existing laceration in this area, you can use lateral brow or upper blepharoplasty approach to access this area. For the fracture along the zygomedical maxillary buttress, we're going to be using maxillary vestibular approach and perform rigid fixation to repair this area. For the infraorbital rim fracture, we'll be using maxillary vestibular approach with or without transconjunctival approach and see if the rigid fixation is warranted. Infraorbital rim fracture does not always require rigid fixation if you can get stable rigid fixation from repairing the surrounding vertical buttresses. I generally perform rigid fixation of the vertical buttresses first and then decide if the infraorbital rim fracture deserves further rigid fixation. The downside of plating this location is that the plate can be palpable due to the thinness of the eyelid skin present. For the zygomatic arch fracture, we're going to be using a pre-existing laceration to explore this area. Similar to the infrabutter rim, zygomatic arch make up the minor support of the midfacial structure. As such, this segment very rarely needs rigid fixation and is largely dependent on stability achieved by fixating other segments of the ZMC fracture. My general approach for a zygomatic fracture is to reduce the fracture segment into proper position and allow it to heal in a closed fashion. To perform open reduction and internal fixation may require a hemicoronal or a preregular incision approach, which I feel is unwarranted for minimal gain in structural support. I think it's more important to reduce it so that there's no trismus through a Gillies approach or maxillary vestibular approach. And since the zygomatic arch does not contribute significantly to structural support, open reduction and internal fixation along the zygomatic arch is not necessary in most cases. The nasal frontal buttress segment is typically addressed once the nasal maxillary buttress segment has been repaired through the maxillary vestibular approach. If the superior segment involving the nasal buttress fracture is still unstable, and requires exposure for open reduction and internal fixation, I'll consider approaching this area using a pre-existing laceration or a modified lynch incision to optimize cosmesis. Unless there's a concurrent frontal sinus fracture that also requires open rigid fixation, a bicoronal incision for isolated nasal frontal buttress may provide inadequate exposure to this area as it will be located at the inferior extent of the bicoronal incision exposure. Instead, a modified lynch incision provides cosmetically acceptable incision that is hidden between facial subunits. I would also avoid disfiguring gulming incision approach unless there is a, a deep wrinkle already present. For the nasal maxillary buttress fracture, I'll use the same right-sided maxillary vestibular approach and use rigid fixation to repair it. For the right-sided septal spur with narrowed nasal airway, we will perform limited septoplasty using Killian approach, since both anterior and posterior septum is relatively straight. Correcting the nasal maxillary buttress fracture will fix the narrowed nasal airway from the right lateral nasal wall collapse. We'll also perform inferior turbinate reduction with off fracture to further optimize nasal airway patency. For the right nasal lacrimal duct fracture, we'll perform decrosis rhinostomy to stent the lacrimal duct to avoid stenosis. It's important to place the lacrimal stents prior to set the splints going in to allow for sufficient room within the nasal cavity, in particular the inferior meatus, for the easier retrieval of the lacrimal duct stents.
In this particular case, overall sequence of the surgery will be so that the midfacial fracture will undergo open reduction internal fixation first, and this will provide stable bony framework. Then we'll move on to the nasal airway surgery. Once we are almost done with the nasal airway surgery, we'll perform decrosis rhinostomy before placing the septal splints. Thank you for watching, and please head over to part B of this lecture to watch the surgical repair for the case we had just discussed. Thank you for your time, and special thanks to co-authors.